Have you ever peered over the side of a boat and wondered what was down there? Like what's way down there? Beyond our ability to easily explore. Is it something you've never seen before? Is it something ancient? Maybe you will find a prehistoric glass sponge reef. These extremely rare animals were in existence when the first dinosaurs set foot on land. Ancient glass sponge reefs serve as critical habitat to all bottom dwelling species. Once thought extinct, glass sponge reefs are critical to the overall health of the oceans. They provide nursing grounds for rockfish, lingcod, and countless other creatures. Maybe you'll see the beautiful, brilliant orange colors of a yellow eye rockfish, which can live for over 100 years. Let's head out onto the water to try and catch and observe some of these creatures and to try to find, explore, and learn about how they interact with their natural habitat. There is a world down there that most people don't even really know exists. I'm Captain Quinn, and I am setting out to chase my curiosity deep into my home waters. I will build and drop traps rigged with deep sea lights and cameras. I will drop fishing lines, and I will deploy my submersible remote operated vehicle equipped with lights and cameras. These tools will allow us to peer into and interact with some of the deepest, darkest parts of the Strait of Georgia in the Salish Sea, in an effort to explore, study, and document the mysteries of the deep. Once you venture beyond where you would feel comfortable snorkeling or scuba diving, you enter a place so few people have ever seen. These animals are truly bizarre. This place is harsh, foreboding, but it's also beautiful and tremendously important. This is Deep Sea BC. As a kid, my dream job was to be a fisherman, simply because I loved fishing so much that I wanted to do it all of the time. I really love the way that a fishing rod or a trap can connect you to a world hidden below the surface of the ocean. I have been lucky enough to observe wild, bizarre, and beautiful marine animals and places. I am grateful for these experiences and count myself lucky but no matter how much I experience in these wild places, my curiosity and appetite to explore more continues to grow. For some, a curiosity for aquatic environments leads not only to a fishing obsession, but also a lifelong career. I'm heading out to meet my good friend, Eric Vogt, to discuss some of the challenges around studying animals in the underwater world. Yeah, I've, I've always loved the ocean. I've always been curious about what's down there. I mean, when I go fishing, I feel like it's Christmas morning. You never know what you're actually going to get or what you're going to find. And to me, that's always been one of the, the more appealing things that every time I do go out on the ocean, I feel like there's an opportunity to see something brand new. I think that my interest in fishing has definitely contributed to, to my career path and my interest in, in rivers and, and freshwater ecology and fish behavior. And, and it's always been the, you know, the the excuse to get out and spend time in these areas. I mean, the, un the unknown of the ocean is, is huge and we really don't know a lot about what's going on. And fortunately, there are a lot of brilliant scientists doing a lot of fantastic work right now and we are answering many, many questions, but there are still so many basic questions that, that remain unanswered. And again, that's, that just adds to the unknown. There's, there's a million questions that, that we simply don't have answers to and there's a million questions that we don't even know that we need to ask yet. One of my one of my favorite professors at UBC was a fisheries ecology professor and when we got to talking about salmon in the ocean he essentially said that you know we're going to treat the ocean as a black box we know roughly what goes in we know roughly what comes out 
They have no idea what happens while they're in the ocean. And what he's trying to say there is that the economics and the logistics of, of studying anything, you know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is, is unfeasible for pretty much everybody. Fortunately, nowadays, our, our, our the technologies that exist are getting better and better every single year, and we're able to answer more questions, and there are tons of brilliant scientists that are doing a lot of work, but there's still so, so much that we don't know. You drop a line into a world beneath the water, and if you are lucky, you will pull something up. One of the elements of the deep ocean that captivates my attention is the unknown. Basically, if you can imagine it lurking down below the surface of the water, there is a chance that it exists. Sometimes I have a hard time controlling my curiosity when thinking about what lurks in the ocean's deep, dark depths. I've always been fascinated by the thought of a lingcod so large that it could be mistaken for a sea serpent. I've seen some pretty large lingcod over the years, but I've heard rumors of lingcod reaching monstrous proportions. They like to hide in rocky areas with significant current where they can ambush passing prey. It is in these areas that some of the largest lings are rumored to live. And so it is to such a place that my friend Eric and I are heading to with our fishing gear. Our hope is to catch and observe a lingcod at a size that could only be described as unbelievable. There's big fish at 138. These fish have been documented at over 1,000 feet below the sea and have been caught weighing over 80 pounds. They can live up to around 25 years of age and they are only found on the west coast of North America. Because of their anatomical design and highly aggressive eating behavior, they are capable of swallowing prey up to 80% of their own size. My lure touches bottom and almost instantly something grabs it. I can tell by the weight that it is a smaller fish, but it is still a fish nonetheless. There he is. I think this one might be too small. In BC, lingcod have to be a minimum of 65 centimeters to keep. I release the undersized ling and send my lure back down to the bottom. And again, I am instantly rewarded by a tug that feels a little bit bigger than the last. This lingcod is a keeper. It is, it's 65. It's great. But it is not quite big enough to inspire nightmares. These things, I've heard reports of getting over 10 feet long. <laughs> In BC waters, these fish typically spawn from December to March. Female lingcods mature between 3 and 5 years of age, at which time they are typically between 60 and 80 centimeters. Males mature around 2 years of age, at which time they are around 50 centimeters. During spawning, the female will deposit her eggs in crevices along rocky reefs, and the male will fertilize them. These spots are called nests, and it will be the male lingcod's job to protect them from predators. For the larger females, do not stick around. If something happens to the male and these nests are left unguarded, they are generally decimated within 48 hours. You know when you like feel a tug on your rod, you're down deep, you just don't really know what it is and there's always that like insane curiosity to get it to the surface. Something that crushes my heart every time is when you have something big and you lose it before you, you don't even know. see it. Yeah. <laughs> That'll go towards the rock. Oh. No! There she goes. Because <laughs> in your head you're like, I don't know, was that a, you know, a world record size fish? Was it a fish I'd never seen before? Was it a sea serpent? You know, did I snag a mermaid by the tail? Mother All nature. possibilities. Yeah. So, or was it a log? Yeah, you never um, know. That was huge, whatever it was. Yeah, you lost a bit of line there, didn't you? Where did it snap? Oh, yeah. Like, inside. That was your lucky lure. As we drift over the edge of a rocky pinnacle, searching for bigger fish, my rod buckles. This one feels heavy. 
This one feels bigger. That's a really good link. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good, good fish. That is a behemoth. Fishing for lingcod is always exciting. That's a lot of fish and chips right there. You never know what you are going to pull up from the depths. <laughs> we managed to catch a few of these incredible animals, one of which was definitely in the large category. But my search for one that fits into the monstrous category would have to wait till another day. It's crazy to think of these things getting like five times this size. That's it for this spot. The tide's starting to turn, so we got to get out of here before the current gets too hairy. But there's lots of other places to fish and lots of other sea to explore. To see. Tons of sea to see. When I was a kid, Rockfish were the fish to catch if you needed to catch a fish. They were literally everywhere that there were rocks. And there used to be no limit as to how many you were allowed to keep. Today, you are only allowed to keep one of select species. There are a number of factors that we acknowledge as having contributed to the decline of these fish, such as overfishing and habitat destruction. But perhaps there is something lying beneath the surface of the water that is less known about, something that can help point us as a species in the right direction, a path that may lead us to helping these fish and their habitats thrive once again. I take my ROV and set course for a steep shelf that I have marked on my marine charts. I've heard stories of abundant rockfish and lingcod populations near this area. I wonder why. What is different about this spot? I deploy my ROV and send it to the bottom to try and discover what it is about this area that supports large numbers of rockfish and lingcod. As my ROV descends, anticipation and excitement whirl around inside of me, chased by curiosity. What is down there? My ROV approaches the bottom and the search begins. I find a rocky outcrop. Scattered around this rock pile are several rockfish. In BC, there are 34 different species of rockfish, each differing in appearance and lifespan. They are slow growing and do not mature until they are quite old. Some of these fish will not hit a reproductive age until they are between 15 and 20 years. The oldest rockfish ever recorded has been documented at over 115 years old. A major predator of the rockfish is the lingcod. As my ROV cruises the ocean floor, a neon orange flash catches my eye. It's a yellow eye rockfish. They are a phenomenal species to observe with their bright orange colors. They can inhabit the deep ocean up to 2,000 feet and tend to never stray too far from home. Once they find a rock pile that is suitable, they can stay there for their entire lives. They can get very old and have been documented at 118 years of age. They are sometimes referred to as red snapper and are one of the largest rockfish found in BC waters. Juveniles of this species have two horizontal white stripes along their sides that will disappear as they grow and age. They prey on other rockfish, herring, sand lance, flatfish, and crustaceans. I can never get over their bright, brilliant orange coloration. They seem totally out of place in comparison to the rest of the creatures that they share this habitat with. I steer the ROV over the shelf into deeper water, looking for clues as to why this area seems to host more life than others. When my ROV hits the bottom of the shelf, I almost fall out of the boat when I realize what I have found. A very old, glass sponge reef. Glass sponge reefs were thought to be extinct at one point in time. That was until 1987, when a team of Canadian scientists discovered a 9,000-year-old living glass sponge reef 
on British Columbia's north coast. We have since learned that these reefs are very rare and beyond important. They are critical habitats for all rockfish, crustaceans, lingcod, and countless other animals. They absorb silica out of the water, and they utilize it to grow larger. So they are literally made of glass. These animals are very slow growing, and it is estimated that a one meter tall sponge may be 220 years old. With skeletons made of silica, these sponges are extremely fragile. Fishing methods that come in contact with the bottom of the ocean, such as bottom trawling, long lining, shrimp and prawn trapping, can easily shatter their bodies. Because these areas host such an abundance of life, they have been targeted by commercial and recreational fishers for a long time, unknowingly. If the sediment on the seafloor is kicked up by these fishing methods, it can cause these reefs to choke and stop feeding. Glass sponge reefs circulate all kinds of nutrients. They store carbon on the ocean floor. They filter bacteria out of the water and fertilize the ocean. These sponges are incredibly efficient filter feeders that a reef only a kilometer in length in the Strait of Georgia can filter 80,000 liters of water a second. The sponges remove up to 90% of the bacteria from the water, which is their main food source. Unfortunately, there is insufficient understanding of glass reef ecology and ecosystem function to define and assess reef health at this time. But at first glance, this one seems to be healthy and old, as you can see in addition to brown dead sponge, plenty of whitish yellow live sponge growing to significant sizes. Throughout BC, scientists have used sonar mounted to ROVs to discover and map out known glass sponge reefs. Recognizing the significant role that these reefs play in keeping our oceans healthy, fisher folks, scientists, conservationists, and the federal government have worked to protect areas where these reefs are known to live from human activities. When reviewing the glass sponge reefs that have been mapped out to date, an excitement comes over me when I realize that the one I have discovered does not appear on the map. To discover and explore an unmapped glass sponge reef is very exciting. I feel a sense of joy at the thought that perhaps this is an opportunity for me to contribute to the protection of our oceans for the generations to come. The second you go beyond the typical reach of scuba divers, which is roughly 80 to 100 feet, you can almost guarantee that everywhere you go, you are going to be the first person to see that particular spot on the map. And that's super exciting. It makes you realize how much is down there waiting to be discovered. Since discovering and exploring this new unmarked reef, I have reported it to the federal government and hopefully started the process of further mapping it out and protecting it. My hope is that these efforts help contribute to healthier oceans for future generations. One that they can explore and appreciate. An ocean full of life and mystery.